tonight really around the needs of parents, families and people who are caring for children who've been bereaved. The tone of the evening is going to be very much a gentle, supportive and empowering tone. And we, although we have tailored the whole session towards family members, we are aware that there are some members of uh, that are joining us today that are professionals that work in the area, maybe teachers. Um, and what we would say to you guys is that whatever you're hearing today, it'd be really lovely if you could reach out to other families who weren't in a position to tune in tonight, who weren't in a position to connect for whatever reasons, and particularly to those more vulnerable families who um, need a little bit of extra support. So anybody who's here as a professional, hopefully, if you could take that on board, that would be wonderful. We're going to share some ideas, we're going to share some practical information, and we're going to share some personal stories. And we'll probably be together for about an hour and a half. In that time, it may be that we talk about things that are going to bring up some emotions. So again, be kind to yourself. Take a break if you need to take a break. We're recording the session so that we can share it with you afterwards. And then when you're ready and when you have time, you can listen back as well. We have two other speakers tonight, um, and you can see them on the screen here. Um, we have Breed Carroll, who's the chair of the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network. And we have Stephen Teep, who's going to talk to us from a personal perspective about as a parent. Later on, we're going to run through um, the opportunity to do some interaction and some questions and answers. Now, you're all anonymous and um, you'll only see us. If you want to type in a question, we will uh, try our best to respond to those questions. Some of them, you will get a typed response directly to you. And some of them we will try and answer live as best we can. And if we don't get time to address all the questions, we'll look at some way of doing a follow up afterwards. So sit back, get comfortable and join us in this journey tonight. I'm going to hand over to Breed and Breed's going to kick off with an overview of children's bereavement. Thank you, Maura. More than welcome to everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening on our first event of Bereaved Children's Awareness Week. I suppose our event, as Maura says, is very much geared towards empowering you as parents and carers of children and young people who have been bereaved. And uh, when we think of children who have been bereaved, we think of the loss that they have, and we think of them as being the loss of a parent, or of a sibling, of a grandparent, maybe a much loved grandparent, family member, a friend, a peer, classmate, clubmate, these people that they have known in life. And all of these losses have different impacts on our children. Tonight, when we turn around and we think about it, and I'm thinking over the last number of months of COVID, how many times I've had conversations with parents where death was impending or that death has just taken place. And the biggest concern was always, if the children are okay, I'll be okay. And I think in light of that, one of the things that happens is that, you know, what we, we need to look at is that actually for ourselves as parents, we need to put on our own oxygen mask first. We need to actually find what we need for this journey of grief. Tonight, we're talking about the children's grief. Where do we source information on how to grieve for ourselves as adults? Maura will talk about face where she can signpost you for that later in the event. When we think about it, if we put on our own oxygen mask, well, then we need to look for information, information for ourselves, information on to how children actually grieve. And what do we need to know? The first thing is we have to realize that children don't actually grieve in the same way as we do. When we meet our losses, we end up in the situation where we actually enter into a river of grief, if you think about it, where we're going from one bank to another, having to wade through that river, perhaps for quite a long time before we finally come to a place of accommodation on the other shoreline. 
that burden is far too heavy for our children. They just can't do it. So instead, what we find them doing is they splash in puddles. They splash in puddles of grief. It comes intermittently. The other thing about it is that it's extremely intense when it comes. And sometimes you think it's overwhelming because you watch your child cry for an hour or even two, and maybe they've only fallen outside and cut their knee. But the response is just way out of proportion to what has just happened. And the thing about it is our presence is so important to them in that moment. When we turn around and we think about it, the burden is too much for them to carry. So they won't stay with it too long, but it gets triggered sometimes, sometimes by activities. I think of a young boy telling me once, you know, I heard a dad whistle on the sideline, but I realized it wasn't my dad. And he ended up exceptionally upset. I think as parents too, we often think the time of day is a big one. And my goodness, I'm sure every one of you will nod in agreement when you think bedtime. How many times have our children come along? And we've all seen it. Last hour of the night, there's nothing left in your tank. And can I have a conversation? Teenagers are the best in the world for it. But the little ones creep into the bed beside you. And sure, it's easier to just roll over and let them stay there. And that's okay, because sometimes that hope is worth a thousand words. When we turn around and we think about it then, we think of our children as being so honest and frank. And I just watch parents sometimes, some of the youngest of parents, dealing with young families, where their three-year-old, five-year-old, can be so frank in what they say to them that they just pin them to the wall. You didn't look out for my daddy. He's gone now. Why didn't you go visit Granny? And in these times that we're living through, we all know how difficult it is to hear words like that from our children. One of the things that I will say to you is they protect us. They actually watch us. And I think we all know just how curious children are. And in fact, they listen to every conversation, every word that's uttered from us. The walls have ears in our houses when we're going through these losses because children have picked up on every nuance. And the thing about it is we need to go back and reassure them, even going back to say, and what did you hear of that conversation now? Because even if it is that it's at the end of life and death is imminent, and they're hearing a conversation, but nobody's actually saying it to them directly. It's very important that we do. And I know it's a struggle to actually be in the situation of so much emotion ourselves and be supportive and parenting to them. But we don't want to knock them down the stairs at the end days of a long illness. Instead, we need to gently take them step by step to the reality of what's happening. We need to include them. Children hate to be excluded and they hate silence. They need to be heard. I think in the age that we're living in too, and I watch with grandchildren, you know, the smallest of them at three and four years of age are wiser for their age than we ever were. And the thing about it is they could buy and sell us in what they're observing around them. I think it's most important that we are open with them. They need information. When we turn on and we think about that information, I always think of it as, you know, when we think about how we give play things like jigsaws to our children, the little ones get six piece, 20 piece. They get a bit older, it goes to 100 pieces. And the teenagers, well, they could reach 2,000 if they wanted it. So think about giving information to our children almost like the jigsaw puzzles. We're giving them the pieces of the information that they can comprehend appropriate to their age. Every child in this world that's going through loss needs to be heard. They need their natural supports, whether it's a parent, perhaps it's parents that are overwhelmed by the loss of a child and it's very difficult. 
But child minders can be a fantastic substitute at times because they won't be quite as caught emotionally and can be there for them. Can take them off and give them a lunch. The aunties and the uncles, the grannies and the granddads. And I know these days when we can't reach out that much, that that can be very difficult. But just in the language of our times at the moment, I think we need to gather our own support bubble, particularly in grief, particularly in these days of COVID. So when we come along and we think about them, give yourself credit, you know them best. And if the support can't be within the household, it can be in the people who provide activities. And thankfully the good news tonight is that we begin to move from this level of restriction again in a week's time. And many of those activities will open up again, which is such a release for them because it actually helps them in the day to day, not just schooling. I've heard teens in lockdown turn around and say, they've stayed in study late so that they can be with their peers. That's what they're doing in order to have connection. It's most important. The other thing in talking to them is that we need to watch our language. What do I mean by that? We need to be able to use words like dead and dying. Not words like granny's gone on a long journey, or that a child is terrified of actually going on a journey in the future, or someone's gone to sleep, or in fact, you begin to find a child very anxious about going to sleep at night. So it's most important that we actually speak real language. For younger children, we watch this time of year when the leaves are falling and the trees are going bare and letting them see that all living things can die. But whether they understand or not will depend on their age. It will depend on their understanding of death itself because younger children don't have a sense of the permanency of death. They want us to fix it. I recall a beautiful story told to me in London one time of a little boy whose dad was a pilot. And he was standing at the window of his apartment and dad had died. And he's gazing out of the night sky with the lights coming into Heathrow. And he says to his mum, when is daddy coming home? And she couldn't understand, but this was repetitive. And the thing was, in his mind, if daddy was a pilot and he'd been told that dad had gone to heaven, well, then daddy was in the sky and he could come home. And this is what these younger children expect. They deal with facts. We are the ones that move outside the concrete terms and we are the ones that put in the emotional complexities and say, oh, it'll be too much for them. If your child asks a question, you can be sure no matter what age, they are ready for the answer because they have been thinking about it. The other thing that we need to consider is their attachment to the person who's gone. Children these days may have very close attachments to grandparents because grandparents may do a lot of the child minding. So don't underestimate that when you're grieving a parent yourself. It may be that it's a boy who has done so many things with his dad or the little girl who has done so many girly things with mum. I think we move forward in families by becoming a team, not expecting that little girl to be compensating for mum anymore in the future, or that boy to become the father figure in the household. But we move forward as a team, as our family dynamic shifts, and we try to find a new force field of being within the household. It depends on the support they get. Who gives the support to the children? Where do they find it? Perhaps it's a compassionate teacher in school who actually watches their needs. Maybe it's the coach on the football pitch who always says, how are you getting on, son? You doing okay? Let me know if you need anything. It can be just simple interactions, but they can be in the day-to-day -day circle of the natural supports of a child. If death has been sudden and unexpected, the turmoil that a family has been put into can also have a huge impact on the children. And that can be difficult because they watch the adults around them fall apart. 
become aggressive, not be the people who can hold themselves together. And it's almost as if they sit and watch like the pillars fall around them. I remember hearing a young teenage girl say once on a Remembrance Day to other parents who were saying, oh, my teenager never talks to me. And this young girl, about 15 years of age, said, can I answer that? And I said, certainly. And she said, I couldn't. The whole household was falling apart, she says. I couldn't talk to them. It was only when they got their act together that I was able to say how I felt and what it was like for me. So listen, please, to what they say and what they don't say. Their normal reactions emotionally are so much like ours, a thousand emotions. But one of the things I watch in children is they don't actually understand how to regulate their emotions. We see it in the smaller ones. There'll be much more acting out rather than the idea of actually, because they don't have the language of emotions. They can't tell you, I'm actually feeling very angry because this is so unfair and I don't like it. But in fact, they act it out. They have a tantrum. And then we try to stop them halfway through. But in fact, let them have the tantrum. Let them bring themselves up to the rise and regulate themselves back into normality. It's so important because, and I just, in the last week, I chatted to a little boy of 10 who has gone through a lot of grief in the last few years. And I, I said to him, you know, what has been the best thing for you? And he said, beginning to understand that my feelings are normal. And in fact, when my mom tried to tell me that, I know now she was right. But in fact, at the time, I was too fragile inside to hear her. So I fought against her. So be patient with them, please. They have an awful lot to say when the timing is right. Perhaps it's to go for a walk in the woods. Watch it with your children. When we walk side by side, we're not eyeballing each other. We can have the most open conversations. Many times do you do when they're captive audience in the front seat of the car. But they can speak to the ether and to the wind and they can say exactly what they're thinking. Find those opportunities and use them and create one-to-one -one time with each of your children, because they're each different people, they're all grieving in different ways, and they're all different personalities. So give them a little time each week. That can be your time, special time, so that you can talk together. They will find it in physical things. How many times will you see a child suffer schoolitis when they're in grief? Oh, I have a pain in my tummy this morning. I have a sore throat. I have a earache. And they're all just symptoms of the physical holding of this pain of loss. We have it ourselves. We feel it in every inch of our being when we go through it as adults. The children are no different in that way. But one of the things we need to realize is that for children, the loss in childhood is not a once off event. They will revisit it at every transition in their lives. We must remember that, especially as we move forward in our own lives, that even years later, we don't leave them behind. I watched input on a festival of grief recently where many young adults talked about who had loss of parents in childhood talk about or of siblings too going off to places like a pilgrimage in their young adult life to reconnect with the person they had lost i think it's vital to our children because it's almost like going to find your roots in the last step of finding your identity that will give you wings to move out in life so we need to be cognizant of that as we move along. When we think of the different ages, we consider that, you know, from naught to three, the preschoolers have a sense of loss, but no understanding. They search and yearn. And many parents say, oh, my goodness, they're so clingy. I can't even go into the bathroom in base, but they're on my day. But they're scared and they can't articulate it. 
and they need lots of cuddles from us and reassurance. They need adults to support. The three to five year olds don't understand permanency. These are the ones that are starting school, big school, or have been in play school. And the thing about it is that they, we need to realize that they're also at a stage where they're learning trust vis-a-vis -vis mistrust. So they can be very scared of that big world. And often they won't get out of the car at school in the morning because they're afraid of a parent not being there when they get back in the evening. They need to be so told simply that they are loved. I've watched parents put little hearts on the back of their children's hands at that age, put one on their own and say, that's the link between us. There's the most beautiful book written, The Invisible String. And in fact, you can now play it on YouTube. And the interesting thing about it is it lets children realize that they have a connection to those that they know in life, no matter where they are. And that's so pertinent in COVID times. And again, to those who they have lost, whose essence can always be with them. And I find this book is beautiful because children can use it. And you can use it at home and listen to it play it and let the child make their own string and pin onto it the hearts of all those people that they're connected to. They suddenly realize the huge community of support they have amongst those natural supports. Elke Barber, the author, has written a book, Is Daddy Coming Back in a Minute? And in that book, she talks about explaining death to a very young child. And when the child talks about her, their heart being so full of grief that they have no room for anybody else, she gets them to think of all the people that were on that invisible string. And then they expand the heart. And they realize, just like we do in time in our grief, that in fact we grow bigger to hold our grief. And we still have room for all the other people who love us. When we think of the five to nine-year-olds, this is the age of magical thinking. I think youngsters at this age are just phenomenal. They just think that they rule the world. And the thing about it that we need to watch most is that in that, there's unspeakables. They may actually think, and this sibling loss can be huge, that something I said or something I thought caused my sibling to go or caused this, caused this person to die. And it's most important to reassure them that nothing like that can cause somebody to go. Because it feels so big in their thought process that they're terrified to tell anyone. And just as we understand surrealness, they see it in this as they move forward. They carry a lot of fear. Fear of the dark. They start to regress. You may even see bedwetting in this age. You may see thumb sucking coming on. You may even see them regress to baby talk. And all of these things are quite normal at this age. Remember, they're curious and extremely frank. They need to know and learn that their feelings are okay. One of the things that we need to do as parents with them is to be proactive. Don't just dash in because they've come in from school, slam the bags and let it fly. But come back later and say, having a bad day today. What's been happening? Teacher was teaching English and they had a poem and it was actually about loss. And I got very upset and nobody even noticed. That's so hard on a young teenager. And when we turn around and we think about our young teenagers, that's in the age of nine to 12 years, because teenage years begin much younger now. And the thing about it is they do understand the finality of death. If there is a loss, it's very important that we give them appropriate language, especially if a loss is sudden or traumatic and that we give them the information that they need. We may be anxious that, oh, it's overburdened them, but in fact, we may be causing them more problems by remaining silent and not filling in the information because they will fantasize the facts 
if we don't give them some of the data. You know your child best. If they're a worrier, they're extremely anxious, be proportionate to that. If they'll take bones and all, give them the information. Because children are all different, even in the same family. So when we think about it then, the other thing that happens with these early teens is that they go into denial. They appear as if nothing has happened, even though you may have sat down and patiently told them all the facts and the detail. Why? Because they want to be like the rest of their peers. They want to be out there in the world, moving forward. And I think one of the hardest things of all for them is the transition into secondary school at this age. It's the first of the milestones after a loss. Maybe it was a very small, comfortable primary school you've been in. I think it's so important to ask our children, what do you need in this transition into secondary school? What do you need the school to know? Will we tell them in advance? And that you as parent, as parent at least, will go along to a class year head or the principal or whoever you're dealing with and say, this is where my child has come from. I remember it happening to, and I've seen it so often, and children who have been bereaved at six and seven years of age in that transition and suddenly it all comes to the surface again. I remember a wonderful male principal in a, in a school where a little girl went into first year. Her dad had died suddenly when she was seven and every day it was just getting, you might as well have sent this child to Mars as going to the school she had gone to because she didn't get her first choice school. She ended up a little bit further from home. And it was so difficult. And that guy made more impression on her than any professional ever will. He turned around one day and he said to her when she was very upset, I'll tell you what, go to the canteen, take two or three of your friends and I'm buying you lunch. And he did exactly what a father figure would do for his daughter at that age. And it was like as if he lit a light bulb. And the child was completely different from that day on moving forward. So let the schools know what they need. The other thing that we see is that in later adolescence from 12 to 17, mid-adolescence, they can rebel a bit. I remember when I was in education, often watching, you know, the first years that had come out at the end of first year. And you think by the time they got back into second year, you wondered what had happened to them because there was certainly a huge change had happened overnight. And there can be a lot of rebellion in teenagers at that age, while the older ones actually can be more open to the feelings of everybody else. They may not want to talk in their teens. They have a lot going for them because they have their own goals and their own destinations to set at that stage. So in fact, the grief at home can be too much. So often grief is postponed for teenagers. It may be adult life before they actually reach. I think again, just to signpost you to a little YouTube clip that is done by Sarah Jane Blackmore, Blakemore. Sarah Jane Blakemore is a professor in UCL in London, and she's done a wonderful piece called Brainstorm. It's a YouTube video with teenagers from the Islington Community Theatre Group and herself. And for every parent, and I've actually recommended it to many parents in latent times, and they turn around and they say, my goodness, it's an eye opener as to how teens really think. Because Sarah Jane's work is on brain development and the pleasure that teenagers grasp out of life. And in fact, how they don't regulate because regulation is too much. What do bereaved children need? They need choice. Choice to be included or not information appropriate to their age, involvement, give them some sense of control. They want to do things. Reassurance, even when you don't feel like you have one left, jot of reassurance left, that you can turn around and say, right, this is, we'll get through it together. Don't know how yet, but we'll get through it. They need routines and they need role models of grief. So please, don't go into the bathroom to cry. Don't hide yourself away in your bedroom. If we don't show our children how to cry together 
and we laugh together with them. They will never know how to do it. Remember at this time of the year as we face Christmas, it can be extremely difficult. This year in particular, it may feel darker than ever. But it's really good to pause on Christmas Day. Perhaps take a candle and decorate it together. And then perhaps share a story of gratitude. Each one sharing the story of what they're grateful for, of the person and their special person that they have lost in recent times. When we do so, we need to realize that we all have stories, that they have the story of the relationship to remember, that we have stories of legacies and love to pass on. And those stories of legacy and love will keep that parent who has gone, or the sibling, or the grandparent, quite alive in the memory of our children so that they can move forward and move forward in life. When you're doing this, support yourself first. Put on your own oxygen mask. Have your support bubble of doers. The people when there's no jot of energy today can collect the children from school, can go and get the shopping, could even do the ironing and just cook a meal and drop it in, please. The listeners, can listen to you and remember because so often you as adults will turn around and say oh they must be tired listening to me but remember somewhere in life if they're good friends you will get your opportunity to be a listener to them so talk to them and have as well the people in life who can be the recreational one the one who takes you out of yourself and says come on we're going for a brisk long walk today till you clear your head Remember, grief swings. We've noticed it today, from your day to today, into this time that we're together talking about loss. And again, when we're finished, when you prepare for tomorrow. Remember for our children that more than anything, they want us to combine our parenting with care and love. When our hands are empty, to stay our ground, and share the frightening darkness with them. Remember, a hug is worth more than a thousand words. We can't fix it, but we certainly can share it together. Thank you. Thank you, Breed. That was absolutely lovely. Um, and I hope that you have a minute now to take a drink and relax for a bit um, because I know you will be called on later on when we move into the questions and answers session. Um, I'm aware that uh, we have a background team that are trying to uh, look at the login arrangements and I'm aware that there are still people trying to log in and having some difficulties logging in. Um, but just to say that Live um, recording is, as I said earlier, we will share the recording afterwards. The other thing we'll share is at any point when any of us are talking and we make reference to things like the way Breed was making reference to the book, The Invisible Strings, the book, the Elkie Barker book around Is Daddy Coming Home and the YouTube video um, that she was talking about. We're going to add all the links for those into the email that we'll send to you with the recording. So I know that that's popping up in the questions. People are looking for the referencing uh, for that. So don't worry, we will absolutely forward them on to you and make sure you all have access to anything that we make reference to. We'll send you the proper links for and the information. Um, we're now gonna move on to a little piece um, and I'm going to do this piece where I'm going to share uh, some slides and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some practical things that you could do to, to work with children and to get them to open up and express themselves. And at this point, um, okay, 
At this point, this is the point. Oh, it went to the last slide. Lovely. Oh, there we go. It's at this point I have put my glasses on. So, as you know, we're doing this as part of Bereaved Children's Awareness Week, but throughout the year, we're always working on different ways to raise awareness. We have a lot of information on our website, and I think anything um, that we've been talking about, you will be able to find the reference in the information for, on our website as well. We've talked about how children express grief differently. And we've talked about the fact that as adults, sometimes they need a little, sometimes as adults, we need help in having those conversations with children, but also sometimes children need help to find ways to express themselves. As Breed was saying, play is an outlet for grief. Children are just hardwired to play. They don't immerse themselves in grief all the time. They have moments where they're very, very upset. And then within a short space of time, they want to get out and play because they explore their feelings and they understand the world through that play. And we often think like that about younger children, but with, with teenagers, I often think their way to, to zone out and to, to, to get away from the constant pressure of feeling the grief all the time is to plug themselves into their devices, listen to music, scroll endlessly to social media, and just hang out and try and be normal and feel normal. That's teenagers' way of, of kind of dipping out of grief. So what we would be looking at over the next couple of slides is just some simple everyday things that you could do together as a family that might help your children open up around grief and might help you prompt conversations with their children because it really is important to have those conversations and to help them find the words to talk about what's going on and for you to get a feel for what's going on in their heads and Breed mentioned earlier how how important words are because children will hear things even if you think you've been as clear as anything to them sometimes particularly younger children They'll get muddled in their heads about what they've heard and understood. And unless we ask them what they're thinking and get them to express it, we really don't know what's going on in their head. So these exercises are ways for you to help you to have those conversations and for you to understand what's going on in their heads and for them to share their worries and concerns. And that whole shoulder to shoulder just uh, stuff that Breda was talking about, sitting in the car together, not eyeball to eyeball, because it's much easier for children to have conversations shoulder to shoulder, side to side. And that might be sitting down together on the floor, playing Lego. It might be sitting at the table coloring. It could be baking a cake together or making a meal or any of those type of things, planting flowers, doing something in the garden. You know, so they're all like just everyday things that can create that space for conversation. Now, not all children will want to talk and that's okay. But it's important for adults to let them know that even if they don't want to talk now, you're there for them and you're available to talk when they're ready and when they feel like they're able to talk. So the first little thing we're going to suggest is something really simple, and it's the memory jar idea. Now, the idea of, of putting a jar somewhere that everybody can reach and in a visible place in the house with, a, with some note paper and a pen is almost symbolic and you're sending a message that we talk about our loved one in this house. We share our memories and we talk about them and we do it in, a, in an open way. So it's creating that space and that visible symbol of openness around talking. And again, you can fill the jar as a family together. You can all sit down and say, let's write down some things and we'll all pop them in the jar. Or people can do it individually or privately. Then either individually, somebody can come along and take something out and just have a look at it and maybe talk about it or share or just keep it to themselves. Or you could do that as a family exercise. Now, in many ways, it's, it's the opportunity that this gives a family to prompt conversations. So sometimes it might be you as the parent a little bit worried that your child is very closed up and isn't talking or isn't sharing memories. And you might take something out of the jar to prompt a conversation. 
or vice versa. It could very much be the child is nervous about upsetting you by saying something, but the jar gives them permission to take something out and start a conversation. So it's just a really simple little thing that you can have in a family. And it helps that culture of openness that you um, that we would be actively encouraging you to have, because the more you're open, the more open you are about talking to children and the more you share your emotions, um, the better it is for them to learn how to handle and their grief. And the next little idea is for those of us, for those times everybody wants to scream. Now we could use this ourselves, but very often there's some children and they just don't know how to get the words out. And they just, it comes out in their temper, in their anger, in their frustration and in their behavior. And that's okay, that's normal, but sometimes it can happen and it can be disruptive and it can be difficult. So doing a little exercise like this is tells that child that it's okay to have these angry feelings. It's okay to feel really annoyed and really upset. This is a very unfair thing that's happened and you, they're really angry and they don't have the words. So sometimes they just want to scream. So it's simple as a cereal box, a kitchen roll holder, a kitchen roll tube and some colors. And then get stuff the middle so that it has um, some paper in it. You can even write down all your angry words and all your frustrations and stuff them into the box as well. Seal it up and then use it as something that you can scream into. You can do it with the kids. They're probably gonna have a good laugh at you screaming your head into a cereal box. But the process of your working that together can be really helpful. It gives them the message that these angry feelings are normal. It's okay. And there's good, good ways to get them out without them bursting them out in a disruptive way or maybe in a, in a way that, or in a place that isn't as suitable. And it gives, again, another, doing an exercise like that just creates the opportunities for conversations that may not happen. And to ask them, you know, is there anything else you want to do? Is there anything else you want to say? Is there anything else that worries you? You know, put it in the box and shout at it. The next little one is about worry. And we all know that some children hold thoughts and worries in their heads. And some will tell you they're, they're upset about something or some as parents, we just know by looking at them, we know by their behavior, we know that they've got worries in their head. And this is a nice little exercise because what it does is it gives you the chance to sit down and to just get a load of little strips of paper. And if the child is able to write, ask them to write down the things that worry them. And if they're not, ask them to tell you and you'll write them down for them or they could draw a little bit, little things. And what that does is it gives you this chance to hear what's going on in their heads. In their own words, they're telling you what's upsetting them. And it may be that they've misunderstood something. It may be that they've misinterpreted something, or it may be they just don't understand and they need it explained more and broken down. But these little conversations, it acknowledges their worries and concerns, it validates them, and it shows that you're able to listen to them. And it lets them know that you they can come to you with these things. And then you tell them, right, on this piece of paper that you've written down your worries, and they might have 10 pieces of paper or one piece of paper, squeeze it up as small, as small, as small as you can and give it to me. And I'm going to put it in my pocket. And I'm going to carry it with me so that you don't have to carry it on on your own. And again, for a young child, that's very symbolic. It eases their worries and it lets them know they're not alone. And it's just a simple little thing, but again, it gets you into their mindset and helps you understand what is going on for them. The other little exercise um, we suggest, and this could be done with any age group, is the whole issue of stone art. Stone art has taken off an awful lot during the pandemic and you see it all over the place. And we know that um, children love collecting things. And like at the moment, most of us are going for walks because there's nothing much else we can do. So picking up and gathering stones along the way, um, they're free, they, 
you know, starting the conversations, as Breed said, walking along side by side, having conversations, talking about what you might do when you get home with the stones, who the stone might be special about, how you might put some meaning into painting and decorating the stone. It's really simple little thing that, again, you can do at home and you can do. And they see lots of it around. They see other people doing it. Um, and one of our members has uh, got this idea to set up what she's calling a stone mad project. And that's an opportunity for bereaved children to do some work with a stone, paint it, just do whatever they want to it. Then maybe write a little caption or even a story and email the picture and the information to her at the What Matters Most website. And then she's going to create a virtual online gallery of all the stones. Again, that gives the message to bereaved children. We're part of something. I'm not the only one that is going through this. I'm not the only one that has these feelings. And it opens up those conversations again. And, you know, this is something for all ages. And then another one of our members, uh, and I just wanted to share this with you while, we, while we're on tonight, because one of our members is an organization called Jacintha Smile, and they're um, uh, a group that are running next weekend a series of uh, music workshops for bereaved children. And I know that they still have some places available, particularly in the session for older children. So any of you who are listening in tonight, if you've got teenagers or if you know of teenagers who've been bereaved, that might link in, it's a Zoom in uh, session and it's a creative session using music. They don't have to play an instrument. They don't, they just have to join in. And it's a very supportive environment where there will be other teens and other young people who are bereaved um, joining in as well. And it's a lovely way to feel like, again, you're part of a bigger community and to create that sense. And it's a really creative uh, idea from the, um, from the group. And you'll see the information on the website. Um, sorry. Technology. I went to the very last slide then is um, just information about ourselves. All the information um, that we produce goes up on our website. So keep an eye on that. Uh, you can also contact us through our website there's a contact function and that email comes to me and we'll always get back to you. Um, we can set up a call. We can maybe signpost you to somewhere else local. Um, but there's, there, you know, reach out if you feel uh, you would like some support. I'm going to show a very small little um, video that we made and it just reinforces the message of what children need when they're bereaved. It only takes, it's only a minute and a half. And um, so I'll play that now. Children grieve too, so what can you do? Acknowledge the tears. Talk, tell me the truth. Have open, honest conversations using clear language. Explain. Explain things in a way that I understand no matter how young I am. Acknowledge. Acknowledge my feelings. Encourage me to ask questions. Help me understand and cope with my emotions. Reassure. Reassure me and be prepared to repeat things until I can fully get my head around it. Support. Support yourself. You can't mind me if you don't mind yourself. Talk, explain, acknowledge, reassure, support. Now, so that brings us to the last speaker before we go into the questions and answers. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Stephen Teep, 
And Stephen's going to talk to us and share, I suppose, from a personal perspective, Stephen, your experience of um, your two boys and how you, um, I'll, leave, I'll, I'll pass it over to you and you can introduce yourself. It's probably the easiest thing to do. Thanks so much, Warren. And hello to everybody. Um, just first of all, Warren, thanks so much for all of those great ideas. I'm kind of at the stage at the moment where I'm kind of trying to research different ideas just to keep my two boys talking and come up with different ideas of creating memories of their mother. And uh, Breed, your, your, everything you said was just excellent. I think one of the things I feel um, every now and then is this sense of loneliness of what I'm going through, kind of like a, as if I'm the only parent that's going through it, even though I'm not. And you know, I always end up questioning, am I doing the right thing? Um, are the boys getting enough from me and so on? And it was, it was, it was just great to hear you mention so many things that um, I can relate to. And the boys seem to be going through. And I just want to just say thank you for that. Because obviously, if I feel like that. I'm sure there's many people that are listening here today that obviously got that sense as well from you. Um, just to, I suppose, quickly introduce myself. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Stephen. Um, I lost my wife, Irene, just over three years ago to cervical cancer. She was 35. And at the age of 36, I became a widower, but also um, a single parent of two grieving young boys. Our children, Oscar and Noah, were only four and two when their mother passed away. And what I want to do is just base, I suppose, just was give a kind of a real life story of just what we've been going through. Um, like the way... I suppose I was able to relate to Breed. I'm sure there's people out there that might be able to re relate to, I suppose, our situation. And even if it's just one person there, then tonight's been worthwhile for me, you know. Um, I suppose like what the best thing to do is just to talk about um, both my boys separately, because one thing that I've noticed is with dealing with my children's grief is that no two children are the same. And particularly when one was four when their mother died and just three weeks before starting primary school, my other boy was only two and he was still in nappies and had a very limited vocabulary and obviously a very limited understanding as a two-year-old would. So straight away, um, dealing with my four-year-old, I suppose, was, was, was obviously extremely challenging because at the exact same time, I'm obviously dealing with my own grief of losing my wife. Breed describes grief as puddles and um, ripples. I'm a little bit more dramatic than that. I describe grief as a tsunami and uh, the way I describe grief is like a tsunami of emotion that it doesn't matter where you are what you're doing you could be in the middle of Tesco you could be just walking down the street or you could be sitting in your sitting room all of a sudden you just get walloped and it could last seconds minutes it doesn't matter but it just completely absorbs you and at the end of it you're just feeling absolutely emotionally and physically drained and this was me going through this um, obviously just after losing my wife, but of course then at the exact same time, I'm now a single parent, parenting two children, and I'm trying to figure out exactly how I'm going to deal with their grief. And the biggest problem for me at that time was I didn't have a second to figure out where can I get information or where to go, um, because I was just absorbed into all of that. But my parenting style and Irene, my parenting style at the time was to have a very kind of open relationship with our children with regards to um, talking to them, because for two years prior to when she passed away, um, she had been battling cancer. And of course, we had to relate to our particular our older guy what was going on as he needed to, as we couldn't close the doors, because I think the biggest fear when you do close the doors in your house and you stop communicating, your children create their own ideas in their head of what's going on and nine times out of ten it could be a million miles from what the truth is so we were very honest with um irene's illness throughout so when irene passed away that honesty continued with oscar and it was straight away that i learned about communication and the gift of being able to talk to them because one thing was i'm not an expert when it comes to grief and um, that's Breed and Maura's job. I'm no expert, but when it comes to my children, I think I'm an expert when it comes to them. I don't think there's anyone on the planet that knows them better than I do. So when it comes to speaking to them, to me, I did it, I suppose, the only way I knew how to. And the biggest problem was, is how to keep it age appropriate and speak so they understand. 
And the best way for me to do that was to encourage them to talk about their mother, particularly Oscar, my oldest guy, so we can get questions from him throughout and then answer those questions. But dealing with emotions, and um, Breed was saying earlier about, you know, don't hide your, your tears and your sadness. Um, I suppose because grief was just so overwhelming, I couldn't have hit it anyway, but it was important for me to show the boys that I was upset and that it's okay to cry. So when they started crying about, um, you know, missing their mom or whatever it was, that I could now talk to them about that that's a normal emotion, that it's important you miss your mom. Um, you know, you loved her so much, so that's why you cry. And it's important that we cry. The last thing I wanted was Irene's memory or even the name Irene to be this, you know, this, this elephant in the corner room that nobody spoke about. Um, so I tried to normalize it as much as possible for Oscar and Noah to talk about their mom. So no matter who they approached them or no matter where they were, that they weren't afraid to speak about their mom. And using real words like mom has died or mom is dead was, was something that I actually had done throughout. And it's been great for them because they've been able to communicate it that way. Um, what hasn't been so great was when they actually talk to adults that aren't as comfortable with debt or haven't experienced grief. And they then go, particularly my youngest, um, a neighbor moved in next door to me one that, or last year and we were talking outside and he was just after introducing himself. And Noah, my smallest guy was four at the time he comes over and the neighbor's like, oh, hi, how are you? What's your name? He's like, hi, I'm Noah, I'm four, my mom's dead. And the neighbor just almost passed out. He didn't know where to go, where to look. And you know, it, it's, it's heartbreaking to see these words come out from your, from your child's mouth, but it does give you comfort that he's now in his place in his life where he can actually talk about it. And it's very important to me that they do have an element of comfort. It's never easy to hear these words come out of your child's mouth, but for me, it's just encouraging them to constantly talk about it. Oscar, since um, his mom passed away, we he started school and it was difficult because for the first year in school, I would ask him, have you told anybody that your mom has died or anything like that? And he didn't because he didn't want to upset his friends. And that took a while to try and tease that out of him. And eventually he did get around to telling one friend and then another friend. And you can actually see he was getting more comfortable in school and, you know, starting to enjoy it a bit more that now this, you know, it's like he got this monkey off his back that he didn't need to stress about anymore, that he didn't feel as different, even though he still was, still was felt a small bit. But three years on, this conversation and the way Oscar and myself talk is no different than it was three years ago. Um, you know, oh, like it was last year or it was maybe about, just over a year ago, he went through a phase of trying to figure out, um, you know, what happened to his mom. You know, I had to explain cancer to him, but how do you explain cancer when uh, you're not a doctor? And I'm certainly the furthest thing from one. So the best way I could explain it to him was, you know, there was a bug inside mom and it, it, it was it, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and that's called cancer. And of course, there was nothing that the doctors could do. And eventually, you know, of course, that's why, why she died and he understood that. But then he tried to come up with cures for that. And he's, a, he's asking me, he's, he's telling me one night, bedtime is the best time for these conversations with Oscar. It just seems to be always when we have these conversations. And he's like, Dad, like, why don't we just get all of the vaccinations and all the medicines? And if you just put it into one glass and we give that to mom, wouldn't that have fixed her? Because sir, that's what medicine is for. And it was just, you know, you kind of have to listen to it. And you go, yeah, maybe that might have worked. I don't know. But I think if it would have worked, the doctors might have come up with it. And you're, you know, you've got to listen. You've got to entertain it a lot of the time. But they do get upset every now and then it's, and, and it's, it was interesting about uh, children, you know, kind of rebelling or breaking out because last year when he, last September, this time last year, um, his teacher phoned me about two weeks in, into school. What happened during the summer was a boy in his class had gotten leukemia and was going to be in and out of school and because of the chemotherapy he was on, he was after losing his hair and the teachers gave us a heads up about this was going to happen. Of course, I was starting to stress because Oscar's version of cancer has a, is a lot different to the story that I needed to tell him now about his friend. And, you know, I told him, look, the children's cancer is different. It's not like the one your mom had and so on. 
And I thought I had him prepared and we, were, we spoke about it loads. And he went to the school and the teacher told the, the, all the, the, the pupils about, about, you know, this child, this boy, Dara, that was sick. And apparently Oscar at the time just went pale and almost fell off in his seat. She could see there was stress and worry. The teacher noticed over the next few days that every time she would call Dara during class, Oscar would be out of his seat looking around his corner over his shoulder to see was Dara all right. But because that teacher had taught him the previous year, he knew she knew exactly his behavior and his manners. And he started play acting and he started becoming the messer and the joker in class, which is very, very unlike him. And thankfully, she was so good that she actually noticed because she had taught him the previous year, she picked up the phone to me straight away. And she said, Steve, look, he's not dealing with this well. He started to act out. And basically what we did was there and then I always I've been working with the teachers throughout have just been fantastic. And, the best trick I have is just to sit Oscar, myself and the teacher down together. And it's all about making Oscar know that I know what's been going on, but his, let him know as well that his teacher knows that his mom is dead. And having this open um, relationship of communication that everybody here in the circle knows what's happening. And then eventually what happens, Oscar starts talking about, he gets sad in school about mom every now and then. And it was great between him and the teacher, they worked out a signal and a solution on how best that was going to work for them and you know it's again it's we, we talk about communication with our children but it's communication with our teachers and anyone that has an adult influence on your children's life that looks after them when you're not around um just even now today even last night going to bed oscar's telling me that he's he says dad i want to talk to you before i go to bed and i was like yeah sure what do you want to talk about and he's like you know the usual and um, so we went up to bed and he's like, yeah, I'm just having a really bad day today. My mom, I'm just thinking about mom all day. I can't get it out of my head. And, you know, all you have to do is acknowledge it and ask him what it is he's taken and, and so on. And it's, it's so difficult to have your little boy, you know, go through this. But the last thing I just want to say about Oscar was, you know, the, the, the way children think. And it just can, at times it will floor you. Two weeks ago, two weeks from now, he turns eight years of age and he turned to me two weeks ago and he goes, Dad, when I turn eight, I'm going to be alive longer without mom than I was alive when she was alive. And to hear that come from his mouth, I swear to God, just ripped my heart out of my chest. And it's one of those things when you hear it, you just want to leave the room and walk away and just abandon it because it's just too difficult. But of course you can't. It's your child. You have to, you have to stay there. And Everything he said is true. It's fact, you know. He that everything he said was just pure logic. He's doing maths in school. He can do the sums. And now, what what are you left to say? That's true. But it's very that's very sad, isn't it? And now you're we're starting the, the whole conversation of emotion again. It, it's been difficult to do to do all these conversations, but it does get easier, I suppose, as the time goes on, because while you do get floored every time, you kind of figure out a way as a parent kind of pick yourself up that little bit quicker and get back into that structure of talking to him about his feelings again. Um, life with Noah, my youngest guy, has been just completely different today. And this is where I've learned how no two children are the same. Life, Noah, as far as he's concerned, really hasn't, has he doesn't really have any memories of his mum. And because he was two at the time, he has no physical memories. And it was one of the things that when Irene found out she was terminal, that, that, that she said to me straight away that really broke her heart that her, her Noah wasn't going to remember her. And from that moment in time, it was like, right, I'm, how do I change this? What do I have to do about that? And it's really been about with Noah since his mum passed away about creating memories for him because he did have two years with his mum. And it's about sharing those stories with him constantly over and over again that those memories become his own. And I was doing an interview yesterday on a news talk and I, I was sharing one of these memories and it's, it's a memory I think if, if Irene was alive, she'd kill me for sharing, but at the same time, it's Noah's story now at the moment. And it was when, I suppose, anyone who's a parent knows when they have a newborn, you're absolutely shattered, you know, you're sleep deprived and worn out and everything else. And um, Irene was after putting Noah into the car one day and she left the, the door of the car open and started to drive off. And it's something that I've done 10 times. I really only did it once. I've done it about 10 times with pure exhaustion. And I told Noah this story that um, mom had done this. 
And he just found it to be absolutely hilarious that now he's always reciting nearly every second time we're in the car. Dad, do you remember that time mom put me in the car and she drove off with the door open? And she's he's like, oh, she's so silly, isn't she? But it's amazing because I told him that story about a situation that happened between him and his mom. Now when he recites that story to me or to everybody else, he says it in the first person, like he actually remembers it in his head. And this is what I've been trying to do with Noah since day one, trying to just talk about his mother and talk about stuff that they've done together. So now it becomes his memory. Because for him, it took much longer to figure out that his mother was missing. And I actually remember that first time it was actually three months after Irene had died. We were, um, I built myself up because I was working at the time and I was, I, I was going to head away for a two night trip with work. And it was going to be right, this is the first big adventure where the boys go to their grandmothers and we kind of separate for two nights. And it was going to be, you know, it was very, very difficult, but it was something that I felt that we, we just had to do. And as difficult as was, did it and came back and collected the boys and Noah, at two years of age asks me for the first time where is mama and this was the first time that i needed to figure out you when we talk about you know how do you say things that are age appropriate and i had to only use words that i knew noah would understand and it sounds harsh it sounds cold but it, it was the only words that he would have understood at the time and it was like mama's all gone that's what i said to him and straight away he understood that his mother was gone and that she wasn't going to be there today. Now, I don't know how long afterwards it takes for him to realize because of his age, you know, that she's never coming back. But what I do know is it's only really in the last year and a half since he turned about three, three and a half, that his grieving process kind of really started for him, that he's now really only starting to ask the questions. And while the questions at the beginning are kind of very simple questions, as they get older, they get more in depth and they require more of a proper answer. Like my seven year old could buy and sell, you know. So the questions he asks, you know, you do need to go into detail. But what I discovered the hard way about no children um, going through it the same was I thought the same answers I gave Oscar when he was when, when he was four would actually work with Noah. Um, I was actually stupid enough to think that it was that simple, you know. And when he asked, so what sort of illness did mom get? And was, um, was, how was she sick and what happened? I started to explain cancer again about the bug inside you that grows and you need medicine and so on. And I was kind of looking away like this as I was just trying to recall what I had said to Oscar and what had worked. And then I looked back to him and I just had this big face, massive eyes staring me, his jaw on the ground. And he's just like, a bug bit mommy? He just didn't get it. He just thought it was a physical bug that bit his mother. And it was just basically, oh God, what am I going to do here now? So the next half an hour is trying to diffuse that and start all over again. And you're now, now you're talking about it as an illness again in a completely different situation. And Noah's grief is, while I described my grief as a tsunami, I think Oscar's grief has kind of been like the ripples and the puddles that breed. Um, was describing earlier but Noah's grief is different again I think Noah's grief is kind of like a tsunami also and it's during the summer just for a simple thing we were we were down in West Cork and there was just we we're just doing a bit of sightseeing and that sort of thing and we came across this famine um, memorial outside Valley de Hob and it's next to a graveyard and Noah saw the graveyard and out of the blue he asked is this where mum is and we, Oscar answered of course and he's like no it's not, she's not, no, she's not here. Um, we scattered mum's dust because we cremated Irene in the sea. And um, Noah completely and utterly lost it for the first time. And that was only this summer at um, five years of age when he really just exploded for the first time. So these tsunamis of emotions, you just can't, can't um, predict when they're going to happen. But for me, the only thing that you can do, the only thing is, that is predictable is how we react and how we um, deal with it with our children. And it's the only way that I've actually been able to manage it with my boys. And that is just been able to talk to them and allow them ask the questions. And if they're not asking the questions or they, if they look sad in the sofa, to kind of prod them to ask them to, um, to figure out what it is. 
I get so paranoid at times that I'm always I'm always worrying about my boys, and if they are really sad and I can't get them to talk up, it's it's I feel like I might even be interrogating them to try and get them to talk. I like, try my best not to do that, but you know I think it's very important, you know, that we acknowledge as parents or guardians that we are going to worry worry about them. You know, um, I do worry about them a lot. I worry about what I'm what I'm doing with the lads is actually good enough. And it scares me to think that I might not actually be doing enough for them. Even though deep in my heart, I, I believe it is. Um, it got, you know, to the point that they know I'm so conscious. Am I doing the right thing? Is everything, I'm, this, this approach of talking to them and communi- communicating with them and encouraging all this chat, is this the right thing that after a year, um, a year after Irene passed away, I booked the two lads to see a child psychologist just for a head examination, just to see if everything was all right with them. There was nothing, no underlying reasons that I wanted them to go just to see if I was doing the right thing. And to be told afterwards um, that I was and that, you know, keep doing what you're doing. You're on the right path here. Keep going. Um, it was a huge reassurance for me. But, you know, it doesn't last. The following year, I was the same. Go ask, you know, back to this child psychologist just to make sure I'm still doing it. And I know I shouldn't be doing that and I shouldn't be questioning myself and I, I guess I should have more confidence. But I speaking to other parents that are in their, this situation, they worry as much as I do. Um, this is the great thing about having um, an event like this is that, you know, you get to learn that people go through the exact same thing as you do. And I think it's all right to worry. Um, the one thing I know is that, look, look, it feels the same. It feels like at times, you know, with the tiredness and the exhaustion and everything else that we can't do this, but we can. And the reason we can do this is because when it comes to our children, we've had no other choice. And the key thing here for all of us is just to keep going and keep that line of communication. It's good to talk. It's, it feels good for me to talk to them about Irene, and I know it feels good for them to do also. So just thanks so much Thank to you. the Irish uh, Childhood Bereavement Network for holding this. It's just something that was very personal for me and for my children. And it's great to see so many people here this evening. Um, Obviously, it's sad to see so many people here at the same time in, in, in talking about this subject, but, you know, at least we can relate to each other and get some good tips from breathing more at the same time as well. So thank you. Thanks, Stephen. That was absolutely just really hit the mark. And I think any of the parents listening in um, would get great reassurance and great support from, from hearing you and your experience. There's been lots of... Uh, people making comments in the in the questions just commenting on on how strong you are and how um they really admire the way you've been so open and uh you know with the boys as they've progressed and as they've been you know from such a small age to the way they're at now so um thank you for that uh, much appreciated um, we have a bit of time for uh, some questions um, there have been the background team of Amanda and Orla have been answering some questions as we've got as we've been going along. Um, they've answered quite a lot of questions directly to people. Um, there is one question to the panel about um, what we feel about the a bereavement policy within schools um, and great ability, uh, greater availability of training for teachers. Um, I know Stephen, you mentioned the relationship with teacher and how that was so important. Um, certainly the ICBN uh, focuses a lot of our energy in developing resources and supports for schools. Um, there's a webinar, we had a big webinar with three or 400 teachers in August before they returned to school after the first uh, lockdown. Um, there's another webinar next Monday uh, for schools. Um, and we're always updating our resources and information for schools, but yes, we do believe that there should be a bereavement policy in schools um, and that, that all schools should have a compassionate response. Breed, is there anything you want to add to that? I think certainly research all over Europe in terms of education on that would say having a bereavement policy is very, very important for schools. And I know certainly any of the information that is going out from ICBN at the moment is recommending that in time schools might be able to actually create their own policies around it. And I think with guidance from organizations like ISBN, because we have an education subgroup here, uh, that they can actually have a very good 
handle on what is actually needed from a child and a family's point of view. I just love the piece, Stephen, where you talk about the teacher, the child and yourself working together. And I think that to me, I constantly say if we can empower the bereaved at any given time and it's natural supports, but the conversations that go on with the people who are pertinent to any particular child. And even the idea where you talk about Oscar and Noah being two very different characters with two very different ways of looking at the laws. Mm -hmm. that each child can Absolutely. be considered for who they are and be heard and that's so vital you know so thanks for that Stephen absolutely and I think it was interesting when Stephen talked about just needing reaching out to a psychologist to look for validation am I on the right track am I doing the right thing that's something we were asked all the time a lot of parents come to us and they think should we be reaching out should we be getting that sort of external support from counsellors or whatever um, and I suppose it's important and it's good to be able to reassure parents to say that the majority of children don't need that external support to, mm -hmm. to get through the grief. If, they, if the family and the other adults in their lives um, are, are, are there to support them and, and, and to talk and, and provide that um, guidance, the majority of children don't need to go externally. Um, only a small uh, uh, few may. And it may be that there's other stresses in their lives, or there are other um, issues that they may need to. But certainly the majority of children, with the support of family, friends, and their community around them, will, will learn how to go, move forward with their grief. Um, Breed, somebody's asking specifically to Breed. Hi, Breed. Uh, how do you explain the word death to children? How do you explain the word death to children? I think it's most important that my sense is use nature and what is around you to explain death to children. So this time of the year where you have the leaves falling and even the idea of painting a picture of the trees where you watch them from being totally bare in the winter. And again, my sense is, you know, it, it's strange when the trees are totally bare, we see everything. When we're totally bereft, we see everything too. And I think we can actually let them see that. And there's, you know, there's little hope in it where the buds come on in springtime and again, we strive in our grief for hope as well to move forward. And again, coming back and looking at it, you know, in the su full summer foliage, it, it, we see the beauty. But this time of the year when leaves are dying, we actually watch them and think, oh, the cycle of life. So there are lots of different books that we can look at. Little Lifetimes is one lovely one on just the cycle of life for children, because we introduce it in that term first that they can begin to understand. So they, they see it, you know, and we can introduce it to them in terms of they watch the worm in the garden or the butterfly that may have died. And they may come in with this and say, can you fix the bird, you know? And it's actually, no, this is what happens. They may not understand the permanency and it will take them quite a number of years. So they still think it should come back to life. Can we make it better? Will we, will we kiss it better? Because, you know, I hurt, her, hurt myself and I get a kiss and it makes it better. But we can't do that. So it's actually letting them see that all living things in some way die and get them to give you examples of what they think of because the child and children today, because they're open to much, so much to the world and information, they'll name the things to you very quickly. So I think we have to hang up over the language and the words, not the children. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a few more questions coming in. Um, I'm going to throw them out. There, there was one earlier and it was asking about are there any supports for preschools? I think we take the approach that the information on our website, even though it's it's primarily written for national schools, but it's equally applicable to um, childcare professionals, community services, um, and we're open to developing other supports for preschools. Again, there's some nice resources that Bernardas have produced uh, talking to very young children about death and we'll add all those links into the information that we send on afterwards. Um, there's a question here, um, any advice about children having bad dreams about the loss of their sibling? Again, I, think it, I, I think it can be it can be quite natural and actually again it's often about you know they waking up whether it's a night terror or whether it's a bad dream as such, but when they waken up in the morning of asking them, you know, what has gone on in the dream, letting them actually tell it to somebody else who can hear it. 
and then of coming back and saying, and what was the feeling like as you woke from it? Because the feeling can be very much, and they are gone. And maybe, you know, they are worried about something around that loss that they haven't expressed that's coming in, into the unconscious of sleep. So of asking the question, are you actually worried about something? Yeah. Around the loss. Absolutely. And then you hear, so it's actually right. And then you can follow up on the next piece of information. Stephen, have you encountered anything like that with the boys? Sorry, I lost you there a second. Anything it's, about bad dreams? Bad dreams with the boys? No, no, bad I, dreams. no, I've never actually had bad dreams. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something that they haven't said to me at all yet. And mm, mm, I don't and know. And they not. And they is it something because I've always kind of I've, I've heard from other people that they've experienced or children have experienced this and you know I end up sitting in the sidelines and waiting for this time to hit you know but no I haven't and, yeah. and, it, and it may never yeah it yeah. may never yeah there's another question um somebody's saying about a little boy he's four next month and he'll be starting school in September um and he's starting to ask more and more questions which is Right. Age appropriate, I suppose. Um, and they're a little bit worried about how they'll manage the transition into school. Uh, his brother died uh, 10 days before he was born and they never met, but he asked a lot of questions. He's worried that the children in school will ask about his brother. OK, so again, it's about actually giving him a language to be able to mm. talk about his brother if they ask of. You know, I, I did have a brother and, uh, well, he, he's he gone now and he has he has died. But it, it's that piece. And, you know, it's the question, if you turn around and think about it for this child, that every parent who has lost a child would say, and have you a brother or sister? So the sibling yeah. is, have you a brother or sister? For the parent is, how many children have you? So it's that question. So giving him a language that can actually answer the question because I'm sure these parents have had to find it for themselves as parents of a, of a child who has died. So I think that's important. And again, it would be very personal to the family themselves. Stephen, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, I would actually. Um, when um, Irene passed away, it was three weeks before Oscar was to start um, junior. Yeah. So like, I understand all of that worry as well. Um, and I know it's kind of like, you know, having, I suppose, allowing him to, to, to talk about his brother as well and not feeling that he goes to school and he can't mention it. But as a parent, you're going to stress and you're going to worry if you're anything like me. And one thing that helped me and was that I actually met with teachers and spoke to them, the principal and the teacher. And I let them, there was a creche um, part of school as well and met with them also. And I told them what had happened, that his mom had passed away and this is the situation and he seems to be dealing with it all right for now and just to say look could we could you maybe phone me every so often and i remember for the first month like the teachers like god like i, I think i'm just one of the luckiest schools ever these teachers are great but they um for the for every week for the first couple of months the teacher used to phone me on a friday just to let me know if anything had happened yeah. and every week it was the same um 30 second conversation he's fine it's grand nothing to worry about um nothing happened we're doing this that and the other in class and you know there's been no issues so it turned out that all my worry was for absolutely nothing but i think it did give me good peace of mind to to know that the teacher knew what we were mm -hmm. dealing with and i think it certainly helped her to know to know that i had shared um oscar's situation with mm -hmm. her also so when it came to like the parent teacher meeting we were able to talk about it in more depth and it really does help so I think any advice I'd give, like in addition to breeds, is, 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 is let the teachers know as well. Um, so if they can see any signs, I'm sure, of course, they'll want to help as well, you know. Thanks. We have another one. Um, and this woman, her, her brother, her young brother died by suicide just very recently um, this year. But he was a really important uncle in the lives of her two children who are eight and five and the two children know that he uh they you know they've tried to explain to them that the death was suicide um but they're also uh both the children are potentially on the autistic spectrum so 
um, they're not fully comprehending it. But I think at, at that at those ages that you know it would be normal for children not to fully understand um, something like that. So I she's worried that they're having severe meltdowns sometimes or being incredibly sad and just doesn't know where to turn a little bit, you know? So mm -hmm. it sounds like she needs some support for herself in the first instance as well, because it's obviously the loss of her brother. Yeah. And it was a sudden dramatic loss. Um, again, breaking it down for children who, you know, we say in an age appropriate way, but we also say in a developmentally appropriate way. So children who are either on the spectrum or who have various learning um, or uh, developmental issues, you know, breaking it down to where they're at developmentally. Um, again, probably a lot more reassurance, a lot more of the repetition and the physical um, support. We have some we have some information that we um, certainly on our website and we have some other information that we've developed around talking to children uh, with particular needs. So um, we can share that afterwards. But is there anything else, Bree, do you want to? I, I think, too, you know, it, it, there's a lot of acting out, obviously, going on at the moment, the aggression around it and that. And I think it's actually about actually finding a way to actually get them to name, because, again, many of these children actually have so many emotions coming in that they can't actually unravel right. which emotion mm -hmm. it is and it's almost like actually working with them around the different emotions and which one might it be today now you used the painted stones earlier but i'm just thinking of painting the faces of emotions and playing with them and where might they feel with them so it's almost like slowing down the pace of the aggression a little bit to a place where we can work with it and then if it's aggression well why don't we go to the bottle bank today now and put in all the glass in the bottle bank? Because it can be a great way of actually releasing it's anger. Actually, There's a lot of anger going on and it actually allows it to happen in a contained way that can be released too. But remember, the anger is like the, the car radiator. It's a safety valve because I always think when, we, when I'm explaining anger to children, it's like the cork in the bottle. The bottle's full of emotions and down on the bottom is the hurt. And the thing about it is, it's the hurt, the unfairness of this, I want to express. Why did my uncle die? This isn't fair. And it's almost like everything is getting shook up. And the thing about it is when the cork pops, all the other emotions will come out. So in fact, there's something healthy in the aggression as well, because it's beginning to let off the steam. It will let out the other emotions. Would you like to come in on it, Stephen? Are you okay? Yeah, you know, it's, it's just it's a reference to emotions. It's, it's, it's every emotion there's a reason behind it. Mm. I'm just trying to figure out what it is. Um, like I said about the, about Oscar play acting in, in in school, you know, there was a reason behind it, and it turns out it was his friend. So mm. I think it's just don't ignore it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's a few more t questions, and and I, they link into the previous question, and it's about. I suppose, and, and you talked about it, Stephen, very eloquently. It's about trying to support your children when you're grieving yourself. Yes. You're overwhelmed by your own grief and trying to be there to support them. Um, there's another question, and it's where the, it, the a child has died within the family and the mother is overwhelmed by her own grief and then trying to support her other children. Again, that's coming up a few times in, in the questions. and. We often say, you know, and, and we say this because we get this from the horse's mouth. The children tell us, you can't mind me if you don't mind yourself. Yeah. You, if you find some supports for yourself, whatever those supports may be, it's important to mind yourself. A lot of parents think if we can fix the children, I'll be all right. But actually the reverse is important. You mind yourself, you get support for yourself and you reach out and then you are able to be there and support your children better by default because you're able to cope. If you're learning how to cope with your own grief, you're able to understand and be there for your, for your own children in that. So certainly reach out. Um, I think this, the, I think the parent I was going to just mention, and I'm Cara. That's what um, I was just going to the say. Yeah. Question, yeah, the question that came in from the woman who whose child um, sadly died, there's a lovely organisation that is part of our network um, and in fact, the, the CEO is on our advisory group as well. 
um, called Anamkara and uh, their support group for, for um, families who have uh, children who have died. Lost so we will certainly, and lost a child, we will certainly um, add all those details into the links. Um, I, think for, I, think, I think for parents mm -hmm. who have lost a child too, there's the paradox of taking care of your living child with grieving for your lost child, as well as all of your own grief within yourself, even for yourself and what you have lost in your life. And the very same thing goes in, in parental loss when you're trying to look after your children and there is still how much of your lifestyle, how much of your dreams, how much of your hopes have gone that has to be grieved at the same time. And it's, yeah, it's colossal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, another co couple of questions that um, we haven't got around to, but we might have another few minutes, I think, and um, we could talk about them. The, just some support and advice about coming up to Christmas, because Christmas is a difficult time. Yeah. I suppose one of the things that uh, to say that is we, we do this in November because November is the traditional month for, for remembrance and also because the universal uh, day of the child is, is within the week that we do Grief Children's Awareness Week. But we will continue to do um, and to roll out support and awareness throughout uh, throughout the year. In December, at the start of December, we move into an adult uh, grief week um, and the Irish Hospice Foundation will be doing some activities and events around that. On the 9th of December, there will be uh, another open evening similar to this. Um, not specifically, it won't be specifically focusing on children, but it'll be about families and individuals called Living With Loss. Um, and we will again, as I said, share the links and the information for that. Um, the other thing that uh, is coming up in December is there's a, um, a, a Belfast film company produced a lovely little film about grief, an animation called Sol. And they're going to launch the trailer of that for us as part of Brief Children's Awareness Week. And it'll be broadcast live on TG Cahar at 6.30 on the 21st of December. And that's um, the winter solstice. And it's something that families could sit down together and watch together and help uh, talk about and support around um, uh, loss and grief. But Christmas is, yeah, Christmas can be one of the milestones and the triggers. I don't know, Brie, do you want to add anything? I think the one thing with Christmas is, you know, make a plan. Keep mm. it simple. Yeah. Do it your way. And even if you feel that you're going to step on the toes of others, still do it your way. And I think it's so important because I've seen families do that and always include, you know, the person you've lost in it at some point, that there's a, a point place for memory on Christmas Day. So there's nobody tiptoeing around each other. And you can find the ritual, make your own private ritual because families will actually tell you all sorts of different ways that they mark it and how they do it. But it is so important. Stephen, would you like to come in from your personal experience there? Yeah, you know, I think like I said, like you gotta do it your own way, but really don't you? Um, it just happens that December, this time of year is, 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 is a ridiculously emotional time of year yeah. for us because we have Oscar's birthday on the 13th of December, Irene's birthday the 23rd of December, Christmas day the 25th, and my birthday the 6th of January. So we are literally for a whole month um, just, I suppose, you know, absorbed in, um, you know, those milestones and of course someone's missing. So for us, it's all about um, celebrating everyone's milestone and yeah, making it as like you said, don't forget anybody in it, you know, so marking Oscar's day and you know making sure there's a cake there because his mother loved cakes and um you know obviously acknowledging Irene's birthday as well in the mm -hmm. same way you know so it's like that I think we we, we, we it's, it's the key is not to forget the loved ones and this yes. time of year and to include them and just have something on the table that's just a reminder about them I think you know that's theirs or um mm -hmm is a memory for them that everybody, when they see it, knows why it's there, you know? Mm. Mm. Absolutely. We, we have, we're, we're, we're gone beyond nine o'clock and I know that um, we said we'd try and wrap it up at nine. There's a couple of last few questions. And I think, you know, given that there's still a lot of people still on, um, 
Are we okay? Are people okay to stay yeah. on? We, we just cover the last few questions. Um, there's a question um, from someone who's saying that their three-year-old is always saying that their granddad and the grandma talk to them when they're, when they're asleep. You know? Yes. Yeah. This is not unusual. A, yeah. Absolutely. The stories you hear of children coming along and uh, I don't question it. I, I think it, there is that sense of presence that we have of the bereaved sometimes. I think children are actually as young as that are far more clued into it than any of us are. And, you know, we see it, you know, we use it ourselves as adults sometimes talking about the shapeshifters or where we actually feel a sense of presence with people. Mm -hmm. And if we turn around and we think about it, you know, I, I think in our Western culture, we've for too long spoken about leaving the those who have died behind us and moving on in life. In fact, I think the essence of those who have lived needs to travel with us. And I think it's mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful when a child voices it. I think it may make us feel uncomfortable as adults, but I think it's very, very important. Yeah, yeah, I think I'd be inclined to just say, you know, that's lovely. What do they say to you? Talk to me. Yeah. And it's it may be just their way of them repeating and remembering the conversations that they had with these special people in their lives. Um, so, yeah, it's it's it is normal. Um, Stephen, there's lots of um, very lovely things being said about you, um, deservedly so. Um, and people really, really appreciating um, that you have shared your personal experience um, and shared your story and been so honest and open about it. And that is so appreciated. Um, and it's great to have you on board uh, supporting this. And uh, hopefully um, it wasn't too much of a hassle for you. And I, I, that you're you you can relax now and uh read the boys a bedtime story if they're not already no gone. They're, they're they're gone. Normally, they normally go to bed at eight o'clock and tonight all right sleep, you see us staying up late if only on one condition they'd be quiet oh so, i see they've been very good they deserve a treat then <laughs> yeah. there's a treat in store there right <laughs> absolutely so We'll bring this session to an end. Um, we really appreciate that, you know, people have given the time to join in. We know that there's other people who didn't have the opportunity or who would have liked to have joined in that, you know, for various reasons, as we said, sometimes this th these things are hard. Sometimes other life and other pressures pop up. Um, but we are, we have a recording. We will be sharing and we will promise to follow up any of the unanswered questions, if we if we find that was unanswered questions, we'll follow up in the email. We'll also, um, all the resources and references that we made, we'll give you links for all of those. And we'll get let you know the other things that are coming up in December. So good night, everybody. Um, I We were going to just play, finish off by just playing out the little video again. Um, so I think, Amanda, do you want to do that? Or do you want me to do that? I'll do that now, Maura. Oh, good woman. Um, and thanks very, very much to Orla and Amanda for fielding all the questions and to Lorraine and Maura Dunn for dealing with all the technical queries. Um, so good night and take care, everybody. Thank you. Don't be afraid to contact us if you want anything. Thank you, Breed. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Thank Maura. you, Maura. Did you click the button? We're not getting any volume. We just read the words.